In this presentation, we are going to finish the Come Follow Me block of Scripture of Jacob 5 through 7. We did five separately. We will now consider Jacob chapter 6 through 7 and the doctrines and principles he teaches us in these chapters. So let's begin with Jacob chapter 6. 6 1, the phrase, This is my prophecy. That is, Zenos' prophecy was Jacob's prophecy. No doubt Jacob had studied and pondered and prayed much over this allegory, and now Zenos' words had become Jacob's words, and it was as though the prophetic allegory had been delivered to and by Jacob originally. In this last general conference address, Elder Bruce R. McConkie began, in his last address, Bruce R. McConkie began a penetrating sermon on the atonement of Christ with the following words. In speaking of these wondrous things, I shall use my own words, though you may think that they are the words of Scripture, words spoken by other apostles and prophets, true as they were first proclaimed by others, but they now are mine, for the Holy Spirit of God has borne witness to me that they are true, and it is now as though the Lord had revealed them to me in the first instance. I have thereby heard his voice and know his word. End of quote. So, that is one way we can come to know the voice of the Word, is through the words of the living apostles and prophets, and that they get into our hearts so deep that they become our own words. Chapter 6, verse 2, the phrase, The day that he shall set his hand again the second time to recover his people. Jacob here acknowledges that the bulk of the allegory, the majority of its prophetic message, is to find fulfillment in the last days, the dispensation of the fullness of times. The Lord is mighty to save. Oftentimes he has intervened to do so. In the first place, as the chosen people of the Lord, Israel occupies an exalted position among the inhabitants of the earth. God covenanted with his father Abraham, saying, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The blessings attending that ordination were predicated upon obedience to his commands, for he ended his promise with these words, Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Obedience was the essence of this promise, which was later renewed or confirmed by the promises made to Isaac and to Jacob. The Lord on many occasions rewarded Israel because of the covenant he had made with their fathers. He brought them out of Egypt. He went before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He taught them with his own lips. He gave them laws to guide them. As a watered garden, he cared for them. Why? For what purpose? To what end? To the end that they may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God. That was early in the time that the Lord set himself to recover his people. But the Lord did not keep his laws. But they, I'm sorry, did not keep his laws. They were rebellious and, at his word, were destroyed from generation to generation. However, the Lord is long-suffering and again will send forth his servants, as spoken by Zenos, to nourish by his word his people. He will give power to his servants to prune the vineyard, that is, to gather the righteous wherever they may be. The whole earth is the vineyard of our Lord, and his servants will go to its uttermost parts to recover what is his. After that, the end soon cometh. Chapter 6, verse 3, the phrase, How blessed are they who have labored in the vineyard. In this verse, Jacob bestows a benediction upon the servants of the Lord who have been zealous and who have preserved in his service in the vineyard of the Lord. It reminds us of the words of the angel who, in speaking for the Lord, said unto Nephi, And blessed are they who shall seek to bring forth Zion at that day, for they shall have the gift and the power of the Holy Ghost. And if they endure to the end, they shall be lifted up at the last day and shall be saved in the everlasting kingdom of the Lamb. Those who do wickedly and refuse to obey the voice of his servants shall be cast out into their own place. How natural it will be for the wicked to be separated from the righteous. How true it is that the wicked cannot endure the presence of the righteous man. Neither can that which is pure and holy mingle with that which is corrupt. 
Man, by his own actions, cast himself out. By his own deeds, he renders service to God or the evil one. That is true and may be seen in the church duty where a man makes him of himself a mighty servant of the Lord or an impotent hanger-on. When the separation is accomplished, the world shall be burned with fire. Chapter 6, verse 4, the phrase, He remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches, means, The Lord knows and loves Israel, both roots, ancestry, and branches, posterity. His memory is perfect. He knows that Israel distinguished themselves in premortality. He knows that Abraham was promised that his seed would populate and bless the earth. He knows that Israel will have been refined in the furnace of affliction. And he knows that the faithful of Israel will go on to enjoy the sublime blessings of her progenitor, a fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. In connection with this verse, let us read the words of Isaiah as recorded in 1 Nephi 21.14, quote, But behold, Zion hath said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me, but he will show that he hath not. End of quote. There are many assurances in Holy Writ that the Lord will remember his covenants with Israel. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The phrase, they are a stiff-necked and a gainsaying people, means to say that Israel is a gainsaying people is to say that they are quick to object, to oppose, restrict, contradict, or speak against that which comes from God. They are slow to believe, quick to disbelieve. Chapter 6, verse 5, the phrase, cleave unto God. To cleave unto God is to embrace his doctrines, to obey his will, and to follow the dictates of his spirit. To cleave unto God is to seek him regularly in prayer, to pursue a course in life which would please him, and to follow that course with fidelity and devotion to the end of one's mortal days. This was a call to repentance, and if they would repent with full purpose of heart, that includes going before the Lord in humility, he would be merciful unto them, and would hold them close to his bosom. What a beautiful blessing. The phrase, in the light of day. To labor in the light of day is to work for righteousness, to plant the seeds of goodness and faith while the sun of opportunity still shines. Otherwise, in the language of Amulek, there cometh a night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. He warned them that in the light they had received of God's mercy and his kindness. Harden not your hearts. In other words, be ready at all times to receive also of his grace and his glory. Chapter 6, verse 6, the phrase, if you will hear his voice. To hear the voice of the Lord's servants is to hear the voice of the Lord. The principle is ever the same. His, the prophet's words, ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. The Savior said that in D&C 21. The Lord's words shall be fulfilled, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants. It is the same. The phrase, why will ye die, referred to, it is as if Jacob were asking his people, why reject the counsel of the prophets? Why not cleave unto God and derive the benefits therefrom? Why yield to that spiritual death which comes from setting at naught Christ and his atoning blood? Those are darn good questions to ask. Why would we ever give up on Christ, who knows all things and has all power? That would be such foolishness. Chapter 6, verse 7, the phrase, nourished by the good word of God. To be nourished by the good word of God is to be fed and built up and strengthened by the word of Scripture, the statement of the living prophets, or the promptings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. We feast upon the good word of God, the words of eternal life, here that we might be prepared for full glory of eternal life hereafter. 
In writing of the manner in which converts to the church were made and fortified in his day, Moroni observed, quote, and none were received into the baptism, save they who took upon them the name of Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end, and were numbered among the people of the church of Christ, and their names were taken, that they might be remembered and nourished by the good word of God, to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and the finisher of their faith. End of Moroni's quote. Chapter 6, verse 8, the phrase quench the Holy Spirit meant, Paul implored of the Thessalonian saints, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Persons quench the spirit when they break the commandments of God and fail to repent, when they begin to ignore the certain voices of conscience and thus sprinkle water upon the flame. The spirit kindled within them. The spirit kindled within them. We also quench the spirit by ignoring its pleadings, by failing to heed the still small voice. Amulek pleaded with the Zoramites, and now, my beloved brethren, I desire that you should remember these things, the necessity of calling upon the Lord while it is yet day, and that you should work out your salvation with fear before God, and that ye should no more deny the coming of Christ, that ye contend no more against the Holy Ghost but that you receive it and take upon you the name of Christ, that ye humble yourselves even to the dust and worship God in whatsoever place you may be in, in spirit and in truth. The phrase make a mock of the great plan of redemption referred to, to continue in sin and fail to take advantage of the atoning blood of Christ, to fail to acknowledge the price that was paid, that redemption might be available, to do these things is to make a mock of the plan of salvation. Brothers and sisters, we are mocking Christ if we do not accept of his atonement and the great plan that he has worked out in our behalf. And I don't think you want to mock Christ and then stand before him at the judgment day. Chapter 6, verse 9, the power of the redemption and the resurrection which is in Christ will bring you to stand with shame and awful guilt. This phrase meant this is an unusual statement. Typically, the scriptures or the prophets speak of the redemption and the res resurrection as blessings. However, in the present text, Jacob speaks of the awful consequences of redemption and resurrection that will be enjoyed upon the rebellious. He warns that those who reject the prophets, deny the good word of Christ, quench the spirit, and make a mock of the plan of redemption. Then the very powers and plans which they spur, spurned shall be the power and plan by which they shall be damned. Though such persons shall be redeemed from physical death to the resurrection, their redemption is limited to a lesser glory, power, and dominion than that fullness enjoyed by the obedience. Those who have been ashamed in mortality to align themselves with righteousness shall, at the time of judgment, stand alone in the nakedness of their doings before him of whom they were ashamed. And they will probably only qualify for a celestial glory. Chapter 6, verse 10, the phrase, the power of justice meant. Though we speak of the law of justice or of justice having its due, we should keep forever in mind that justice is not a living entity. It's not, it is not some object or thing that has no life of itself. The justice of which the prophets speak is the justice of God. Thus, the power of justice is, in reality, the power of God's justice. His judgments will be just. The phrase, lake of fire and brimstone. The phrase, lake of fire and brimstone, is repeatedly mentioned in Scripture. This phrase is generally used to describe either the place that awaits the unrepentant individual after the judgment or the mental anguish associated with sin. 
In reference to the place that awaits those who are unrepentant, modern revelation states, the wicked shall go away into the lake of fire and brimstone with the devil and his angels. In reference to mental anguish, the prophet Joseph Smith said, A man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. The phrase endless torment meant the torment of the wicked in hell is endless in the sense that it is godly torment since endless is one of his names. Thus, those who suffer in hell will obtain an end to their suffering as they are resurrected and gain the Tileso kingdom. Only Satan and his followers, sons of perdition, will spend eternity in hell. So those who go to the Tilesto kingdom must suffer hell. Hell is the gate which you must go through in order to enter the Tilesto glory or kingdom. And endless torment doesn't mean forever for those that are going to the Tilesto kingdom. It just means they will suffer a godly torment. They must suffer as Jesus Christ suffered. Only sons of perdition will have an endless torment, meaning a duration of endless time. Chapter 6, verse 12, O be wise, what can I say more? Meant wisdom is a spiritual gift and is associated with intelligence. It is the righteous application of truth. As DNC 93, 36 to 37 and 39 says, the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Light and truth forsaketh the evil one. And that wicked one cometh and taketh away light and truth through disobedience from the children of men and because of the tradition of their fathers. So to be wise is to gain the knowledge of the gospel and then apply those truths, the righteous application of the truths in our lives. That's why Satan causes us to be disobedient. He knows if we don't apply the truths in our life, then we cannot become wise in intelligence and we do not receive light and truth. Chapter 6, verse 13. This would appear, appear to be a farewell statement and an indication to the reader that Jacob had, plainly, had planned initially to close his record at this point. Subsequently, however, there occupied in his life an incident which was worthy of inclusion in a record that would come forth to a cynical and highly secular world. His encounter with Sherem, the Antichrist. The phrase, I shall meet you before the pleasing bar of God, meant, it is worthy of note that the four persons who contributed the most as writers in the Book of Mormon, Nephi, Jacob, Mormon, and Moroni, all certify that one's acceptance or rejection of that which they have written by the power of the Spirit will be a critical issue at the judgment bar of God. And if they, his words in the Book of Mormon, are not the words of Christ, Nephi challenged, judge ye, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day, and you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my weakness. Brothers and sisters, why would we be foolish not to follow and obey and cherish the words of Nephi? We will one day have to give an account to him of what we did with his words, face to face. Now, let's take a look at Jacob chapter 7, our final chapter in this presentation. Jacob chapter 7 verses 1 through 23 is about Sherem, the Antichrist. Jacob seven introduces the first Antichrist in the Book of Mormon. Sherem, like others who followed, used much power of speech and flattering words to teach that there should be no Christ. President Ezra Taft Benson taught that one of the major purposes of the Book of Mormon is to help us discern between truth and error, revealing the motives of individuals like Sherem. Quote, he said, the Book of Mormon exposes the enemies of Christ. It confounds false doctrines and fortifies the humble followers of Christ against the evil designs, strategies, and doctrines of the devil in our day. 
The type of apostates in the Book of Mormon are similar to the type we have today. God, with his infinite foreknowledge, so molded the Book of Mormon that we might see the error and know how to combat false educational, political, religious, and philosophical concepts of our time. Critical race theory, transgenderism, DEI, all of these are exposed as philosophical concepts of Satan if you read and believe and understand the Book of Mormon by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 7, verse 2, the phrase, there should be no Christ. The Antichrist is bent upon the overthrow of the plan of God. He or she has partaken of that spirit of rebellion, which resulted in the expulsion of one-third of all the children of the Eternal Father in the pre-mortal world. Prior to the meridian of time, the Antichrist contended that there would be no Christ and that no man had the ability to speak authoritatively concerning things future, which ironically would take a revelation to know. To know that you cannot speak of things in the future would take revelation to know that you cannot know that. That's how crazy the apostates and Antichrists are. Their logic is illogical. The Antichrist contends that there is no need for a savior, that man is perfectly capable of securing his own happiness and well-being. Yeah, how, how, how is that going for us in the world? And that any trust in or allegiance to things beyond human reach or reason is futile. Clever ploys of the modern Antichrist include an insistence upon the preeminence of man, an exaggerated stress upon man's self-reliance, an emphasis upon Jesus as the great moral teacher and community leader with a corresponding de-emphasis upon the necessity for spiritual regeneration through a blood atonement. The phrase, many things which were flattering, referred to, characteristically, Antichrist are glib of tongue and numble of speech. They are sinister students of human behavior, knowing how to persuade and to dissuade, how to attract attention and create a following, and how to make their listeners feel secure and comfortable in their sins. See, there is a key. If you are starting to feel comfortable in your sins and that they're not that bad, then you are following after an Antichrist. Eschewing the robes of righteousness, the Antichrist labors to popularize the rags of immodest speech, thoughts, and actions. The phrase that he might overthrow the doctrine of Christ refers to, the Antichrist is at war with the gospel and with that earthly kingdom which is ministers it. He is angry with truth and seeks its overthrow. His wrath is born of a hatred for those principles which testify against his own wickedness. Do you see how easy it is because we have the Book of Mormon to identify Antichrist and who not to follow when people stand up in the church and claim to speak with authority but it's against truth? that we know from prophets and scripture. Chapter 7, verse 3, the phrase led away the hearts of the people, rent. The Antichrist seeks to lead away the children of God from the true worship of the Father and the Son through tempting, taunting, and tantalizing them with doctrines and practices which are pleasing unto the carnal mind. The phrase, he sought much opportunity that he might come unto me refers to, the devil and his disciples are neither shy nor hesitant about the accomplishments of their purposes. While some among the legions of Beelzebub are subtle and cunning, the approach of the Antichrist is aggressive and direct. Why the confrontation with one such as Jacob? The devil would always rather capture a spiritual general than one of lesser rank. Such would be a monumental victory to be celebrated by the hordes of hell. And be it remembered that the Lord himself was not immune from personal confrontation with the evil one. And that he in turn said to Peter, the chief apostle, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That's why Sharon went after someone as strong as Jacob. Because if he could get him to fall, think of all the other lesser people under Jacob who would fall in the church. Chapter 7, verse 4. 
An antichrist is a refined and polished devil, one schooled in rhetoric and homiletics. The greatest of God's gifts are subject to the greatest perversions. The phrase, according to the power of the devil, meant the Antichrist has sold his soul to the devil. His power is not his own. He is but a puppet of him who does not support his own. Can you imagine how foolish they are going to feel once they realize they were just puppets being pulled by the strings of Satan? President Ezra Taft Benson shared the following three questions we can ask ourselves to avoid being deceived. Quote, one, what do the standard works have to say about it? The Book of Mormon, Brigham Young said, was written on the tablets of his heart and no doubt helped save him from being, and no doubt helped him save him from being deceived. Number two, the second guide is what to do what do the latter-day presidents of the church have to say on the subject, particularly the living president? And number three, the third and final test is the Holy Ghost, the test of the Spirit. This test can only be fully effective if one's channels of communication with God are clean and virtuous and uncluttered with sin. Said President Brigham Young, You may know whether you are led right or wrong, for every principle God has revealed carries its own conviction of its truth to the human mind. What a pity it would be if we were led by one man to utter destruction. End of President Benson and Brigham Young's quote. Chapter 7, verse 5, I could not be shaken. Because Jacob had cultivated the spirit of revelation, whether from angels to hearing the voice of the Lord, this enabled him to become firm in the faith and unshakable. So too must we learn to know and follow the spirit of revelation if we are going to come off conquerors of Satan. What is the one constant thing President Nielsen has been saying in General Conference? Increase your capacity to receive revelation and to follow the spirit. Because Satan's methods are only going to get stronger and worse and harder and more deceiving as the time goes on. Chapter 7, verse 6, the phrase, the gospel or the doctrine of Christ, meant, Sherem correctly observed that the, do the gospel is the doctrine of Christ. It is the glad tidings that he came into the world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world, and to bear the sins of the world, and sanctify the world, and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness, that through him all might be saved, whom the Father had put into his power and, and made by him. The gospel is the good news of what the Lord Jesus has done for us, things we could not do for ourselves. To enjoy the full benefits of Christ's atoning act, men must exercise faith in him, repent of their sins through him, be baptized unto him, receive the Holy Ghost from him, and endure in faith unto the end. Have you noticed that all of it has to do with him, Christ? Our focus must be on him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Savior said in our day, He that receiveth my gospel receiveth me, and he that receiveth not my gospel receiveth not me. And this is my gospel, repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, even the Comforter, which showeth all things and teacheth the peaceable things of the kingdom. Peace will always follow the presence of of the Holy Ghost. Satan cannot duplicate the fruits of the Spirit of peace. He cannot duplicate that. So if you are at peace and have the peace of the Holy Ghost, then it is true. Chapter 7, verse 7. The phrase, they pervert the right way of God and keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way, meant it is strange indeed that Sherem, an antichrist, would argue for the sufficiency of the law of Moses when in fact the law was given by God to point towards the coming of Christ. The irony and inconsistency of Sharon's argument continues with his use of revelation, the law of Moses, to deny the principle of revelation. Like I said, Go figure the minds of the apostates. You cannot. There is no logic or reason. You cannot argue with them because they are illogical. 
Consistently, those who have opposed the Prince of Truth have maintained the same ironic and inconsistent arguments. Jews of the Meridian Dispensation, in the name of loyalty to Moses and the law, rejected him of whom Moses and the law were co-witnesses. Today, those professing to be fundamental Christians reject modern revelation in the name of the Bible, a book whose fundamental purpose is to attest that the Lord has never had a people to whom he did not speak by revelation. They angrily spurn the Book of Mormon, a book which is imperfect testimony of him whom they pref profess to proclaim. Nowhere in the Bible is it said that there will not be modern revelation. And yet they use it to say there's not modern revelation, which would take a revelation to know there's no modern revelation. Again, the illogicalness of Antichrist and apostates within the church. Sherem was a pure humanist. He believed that man was the center of the universe and that no person could speak of things with authority beyond his rational capacities. Like Korhor, his sole cry was, no man can know anything which is to come. In fact, the Antichrist was eager to assert that no person could know anything. Now, you would have to get revelation to know that you cannot know anything. Hmm. Problems. Conundrums. The contradictions are so obvious. Thus, according to Sherem's logic, it would take a revelation, knowing something, to know a person cannot know anything. This is the confusing world of all those who fight against God and revelation. No wonder they're so conflicted and angry. Chapter 7, verse 8. The phrase, the Lord God poured out his spirit unto my soul. Meant, we speak frequently of receiving an outpouring of the spirit of the Lord. This is a symbolic expression for receiving the spirit in rich abundance. Of receiving the power and direction of the Holy Ghost. Just as one in ancient times could be cleansed and refreshed by washing or anointing with oil, even so can the people of God have the Spirit poured into their souls. They become recipients of pure intelligence, of that pure knowledge from a pure source which greatly enlargeth the soul. There is no weapon that is formed against you that shall prosper, the Lord said to Joseph Smith, and if any man lift up his voice against you, he shall be confounded in my own due time. Ever since Joseph Smith, many have tried to destroy the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and God has confounded every single one of them in his own due time and will continue to do so. Chapter 7, verse 9, the phrase, If there should be a Christ, I would not deny him, meant. What Sherem really means is, if there should be a Christ here and now, one that I can see and feel and hear, one which requires no faith or hope, then I would not deny him. I would believe. This in reality is not true. The unbelievers and the faithless have become so hardened of heart that most of the time even tangible evidence is denied or rationalized. It is an it is inevitable that proof is the last thing that those demanding it really desire. The louder the shouts for evidence, the less the inclination to accept it. The phrase, I know that there is no Christ, refers to. The doubter errs grossly through generalizing beyond his own experiences. Sorry for the misspelling of errors. What he has not experienced, no one else can. Because he does not know, no one knows. Because he cannot feel, certainly no one has felt. Because he is lacking in evidence concerning the coming of Christ, unquestionably, the evidence amassed by every believing soul is either insufficient or naively misinterpreted. Those who dare not believe, dare not allow others to believe. Did you catch that? Those who dare not believe, dare not allow others to believe. Because if they do, then they might be wrong. They have to rationalize away and put down the believers. Again, Sherem's logic goes off the rails, claiming he knows there is no Christ when he just before said no one can know of anything, especially of things to come. He is caught in the conundrum of needing revelation to know there is no such thing as revelation. Such idiots. 
chapter 7, verses 10 through 11, the phrase, then ye do not understand them, referred to. It is one thing to read the scriptures and quite another to understand them. First, to fully comprehend the message of Christ, one must become acquainted with all that God has revealed and must become a student of all available divine records. The greatest commentary on scripture are the scriptures themselves. Central and saving verities are established repeatedly in all of the standard works. The saints are never required to append their hope, build their faith, or establish their doctrine upon a single isolated passage. Second, to grasp the full meaning of Scripture, one must enjoy the same spirit of inspiration which actuated the original writer. Since no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, persons in this day must seek the level of holiness which would allow them to receive the intent and content of that which by holy men of old. Which, what content of that written by holy men of old. So to know the contents is holy and written by God, you must have the same spirit by which it was written as you are studying. God doesn't answer us just out of sheer curiosity. We must have the intent to obey. Sharon, like many of his modern counterparts, was a master of scriptural manipulation. His was not a search for truth. He read with a jaundiced eye. His was a search for justification, not sanctification. He wanted to justify his sinful behavior so that he would not have to repent and change. Chapter 7, verse 12, the phrase, I have heard and seen, meant, And thou hast beheld in thy youth Christ's glory, Lehi said unto his son Jacob. Wherefore thou art blessed, even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. The phrase, it also hath been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost, meant the Holy Ghost is the source of a sure witness unto all persons in all generations, even persons who know because they have seen and heard and handled. Even these must gain the indelible witness to their souls by the power of the Spirit, that the work in which they are engaged is true. Perfect knowledge comes by the power of the Holy Ghost, not by seeing. If I had a choice to see Christ or for the Holy Ghost to bear witness to my soul, I would choose for the Holy Ghost to bear witness to my soul. Because that will burn doubt out. There have been many men in this church and dispensation that saw sacred things and left and apostatized from the church. The phrase, all mankind must be lost, referred to because of the fall, all mankind are in a lost and fallen state, an enemy to God, and has been from the fall of Adam, and will be for never and ever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth to inflict upon him even as a child, to submit to his father. Did you catch that? We don't read that part as much in the church as we should. There are certain things Christ will inflict upon us for our good. Are we willing to go through things he will inflict upon us and trust him that they are for our good? Chapter 7, verse 13, the phrase, Show me a sign. The Lord has said that an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. To which Joseph Smith added that this principle is eternal, undeviating, and firm as the pillars of heaven. For whenever you see a man seeking after a sign, you may set it down that he is an adulterous man. Those who desire a sign without first exercising faith reveal their spiritual condition. So we are pretty safe that probably one of the sins Sherem has committed is the sin of adultery, since he asked for a sign. The prophet Joseph Smith gave a modern example of this principle, quote, When I was in preaching in Philadelphia, a Quaker called out for a sign. I told him to be still. After the sermon, he again asked for a sign. I told the congregation the man was an adulterer, 
that a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and that the Lord had said to me in a revelation that any man who wanted a sign was an adulterous, pers an adulterous person. It is true, cried one, for I caught him in the very act which the man afterwards confessed when he was baptized. President Joseph F. Smith explained the weakness of requiring a sign to uphold faith. Quote, Show me Latter-day Saints who have to feed upon miracles, signs, and visions in order to keep them steadfast in the church, and I will show unto you members of the church who are not in good standing before God, who are not walking who are walking in slippery paths. It is not by marvelous manifestation unto us that we shall be established in the truth, but it is by humility and faithful obedience to the commandments and laws of God. And then the great blessing is that as you do that with all your heart, faithful obedience to commandments and laws and humble yourself and submit to the Father, then God will trust you and give you marvelous experiences to strengthen that faith which you've already developed. Perhaps it is appropriate then that we could conclude that Sherem was an adulterous person. Chapter 7, verse 14 through 20, signs follows those who believe. Miracles or wonders or gifts of the Spirit always follow true believers. Indeed, they are one of the signs of the true church and an evidence that the power of God is operating among his people. Where the church and the kingdom of God is, there are also signs and miracles. Where these things are not, their faith is not, and there the church and the kingdom of God is not to be found. Signs may have the effect of strengthening the faith of those who are already spiritually inclined. But their chief purpose is not to convert people to the truth, but to reward and bless those already converted. That's the power of us and the reason for signs. Those who already have faith and are converted to strengthen them and to bless them more. To seek the gifts of the Spirit through faith and humility and devotion to righteousness, Elder McConkey has written, is not to be confused with sign seeking. The saints are commanded to covet earnestly the best gifts. Do you notice the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thy mad servant, and so on, etc. This is one thing God has commanded us to covet. We are to covet spiritual gifts. Isn't that interesting? But implicit in this exhortation is the presumption that those so seeking will do so in the, war, the way the Lord has ordained. For instance, the gift of the testimony is attained through a course of desire, study, prayer, and practice. Indeed, whenever a person abides the law, entitling him to receive a gift, that gift is then freely bestowed upon him. End of quote. Chapter 7, verse 14. The phrase that I should tempt God to show unto thee a sign meant, Sherem was unworthy for a confirming sign, the kind of manifestation reserved for the faithful. Nevertheless, Jacob knew that Sherem knew that the doctrine of Christ was true, and thus that his own preachments were false and destructive. This is frequently the case among Antichrist. When it really comes down to it, they know that they are wrong. That's why they're trying so hard to rationalize it, because deep within the heart of their hearts, they know that their preaching is wrong. The phrase, if God shall smite thee, let that be a sign, meant the dreadful outcome of such sign-seeking as that of Antichrist, Sherem, and Korahor may well constitute a pattern typifying the ultimate outcome of all sign-seeking. The phrase, Thy will, O Lord, be done, meant the prophets of God, like their master, have an eye single to the glory of God. They have no private agenda, no secret or personal vendetta against mankind, but rather a desire to warn and testify of eternal truth that all men may repent and turn to paths of righteousness. Chapter 7, verse 15. The power of the Lord came upon him. Yea, signs come by faith unto mighty works, for without faith no man pleaseth God, and with whom God is angry he is not well pleased. Wherefore unto such he showeth no signs, only in wrath unto their condemnation. Sherem did get a sign, but it was unto his condemnation, 
not to bring him faith. And that will be the same for all those who seek for signs to be converted. It will be to your condemnation. Chapter 7, verse 16. For I shall die, that phrase meant, life's darkest reality is death, and death is the great moment of truth. In the words of Elder Bruce R. McConkie, death is a subject which strikes dread, even terror, into the hearts of most men. It is something we fear of which we are slowly afraid, and from which most of us would flee if we could, end of quote. Even the most hardened atheist and the most elusive agnostic face what they believe to be the end with fear and trembling. Sherem, in the knowledge that he is about to face his God, seeks to purge his soul of duplicity. Chapter 7, verse 18. That he had been deceived by the power of the devil, that phrase meant... It does not take long before those who teach doctrines which are pleasing unto the carnal mind begin to believe and practice the things they teach. Satan is the arch deceiver. He is smooth and his ways are slippery. His philosophies are appealing and his religion is captivating, particularly to those who yearn for salvation without obligation and commitment. That is a key. That is pleasing to the natural man. The phrase, he spake of hell and of eternity and of eternal punishment, meant these are doctrines which would normally be scoffed at by the learned and ignorant and ignored by the sophisticated. Sharon now spoke of these things because they weighed upon his mind. Hell and eternal punishment were to him no longer religious rhetoric, but reality. Chapter 7, verse 19, the phrase, I fear least I have committed the unpardonable sin, meant, though the ultimate fate of Sherem is not known to us, whether, for instance, he will come forth in the resurrection of the terrestrial or telestial kingdom, this we do know. Deathbed repentance does not have within it the seeds of everlasting life. His sin is not unpardonable. He will not be numbered among the sons of perdition, for he still possessed a soul capable of repentance, which disposition is wholly aligned to a son of perdition. The phrase, I confess unto God, referred to, confession at any time is to be commended, even just prior to death. But true repentance consists not of only in forsaking forbidden behavior and attitudes, but also in keeping the commandments thereafter. It is well that Sherem acknowledged his lies and professed a belief in the scriptures and the coming of Christ before his demise. His situation would, however, have been far more positive had he not been compelled to believe. He could have, if he would have just repented, still gotten back on the straight and narrow path to a celestial kingdom. But he committed enough sin where it kicked him out of that kingdom and he will only inherit either terrestrial or telestial. Chapter 7, verse 21, the phrase, the power of God came upon them. That is, the Spirit of the Lord bore testimony to their souls that the doctrine of Christ was true, that Sherem's punishment was indeed sent by a God who will not be mocked, and that a like fate awaits all those who perpetuate a lie and do so despite to the spirit of grace. Chapter 7, verse 22, the phrase, for I had requested it of my Father who was in heaven, meant the gospel teacher's eager for teaching moments. His constant prayer is that the God of heaven, he who knows all things and is the discerner of our thoughts and intents of our hearts, will provide an atmosphere for spiritual learning, an occasion wherein the truths of salvation can be presented and felt. Jacob rejoiced in the spiritual regeneration of his people, not in the prophetic fate of Sherem. Chapter 7, verse 23, the phrase, they searched the scriptures, refers to. One of the effects of teaching the gospel by the power of the Spirit is the desire on the part of the listeners to search the scriptures. And it came to pass that after Alma had made an end of speaking unto the people of Ammonihah, many of them did believe on his words and began to repent and to search the scriptures. In speaking of the work of the of the work of Paul the apostle, Luke wrote, and the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, 
who coming thither went unto the synagogue of the Jews, there were more notable than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. We must continue to search the scriptures as teachers and as listeners. Chapter 7, verse 24, the phrase, Many means were devised to reclaim and restore the Lamanites to the knowledge of the, first, of the truth referred to. Fruits of the Spirit include love, peace, long-suffering, goodness, and faith. One who is moved and motivated by that Spirit seeks to share those same fruits with all men. Thus the Nephites sought endlessly to reclaim the Lamanites from their fallen state, to awaken them from their spiritual slumber. Their efforts, unfortunately, were repeatedly rejected. Chapter 7, verse 25, the phrase, trusting in their God and the rock of their salvation, meant, we quote often the following scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but which is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. We use this scripture to justify that we will not be tempted here in mortality more than you can bear. And we stop there thinking this is unconditional. However, the last part of the verse has a condition. Quote, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. As Jacob points out that the escape to any and all temptations of our enemies is trusting in our God and the rock of our salvation. If we do not take that escape, who is Christ, we will be tempted more than we could bear in ten lifetimes. If we want the blessing of not being tempted more than we can handle, then we must take the escape. And that escape is submission to the will of Christ. We have got to quit quoting only part of that verse and quote all of it. If you will not want to be tempted more than you can bear, then you must follow the conditions it is based on and to take the escape, which is coming unto Christ with a fullness of heart. Chapter 7, verse 26, the phrase, the time passes away with us like a dream, meant how poetic and descriptive Jacob is in describing the fleeting moments and the hours of our mortal probation. Moments blend into hours, hours into days, days into years, years into decades. Because our stay here is temporary, because the day of probation is over in an instant, as it were, because our handling of time will be determined largely our place and station in eternity, for these reasons the prophets continually plead for the people of the earth to guard their time, to improve their time, and to make wise use of their time. The phrase, a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers, referred to, the life of the Nephites was, during the greater part of their history, one of loneliness and heartache. They sought endlessly to teach and persuade and love their brethren, the Lamanites, without success. In addition, the Nephites, like all of the faithful, all the faithful in all ages, were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Chapter 7, verse 27, the phrase, Brethren, adieu. Some anti-LDS critics of the Book of Mormon has raised the question as to how Jacob could possibly have used such a word as adieu when his word clearly comes from the French language, which was not developed until hundreds of years after the time of Jacob. Again, here is the stupid logic of Antichrist and anti-Mormons and apostates. Such critics evidently overlook the fact that the Book of Mormon is translation literature, and Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith felt free in his translation to use any words familiar to himself and his readers that would best convey the meaning of the original author. Duh! It is interesting to note that there is a Hebrew word, lehitriot, which has essentially the same meaning in Hebrew as the word adieu has in French. Both of these words are much more than a simple farewell. They include the idea of a blessing. 
but it would be unreasonable to remind the critics that none of the words contained in the English translation of the Book of Mormon, of the Book of Jacob, I'm sorry, were used by Jacob himself. These words all come from the English language, which did not come into existence until long after Jacob's time. So it would be stupid for Joseph Smith to literally translate, and now I, Jacob, say Lehitriot. That would mean nothing to us. That would be a stupid translation. So he says, I bid you adieu, which we understand what that means. And Lehitriot in Hebrew means the same thing. Again, you cannot go figure the minds of the apostates. They are so warped in logic. It is unbelievable. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with the final chapters in the book of Jacob and that you have received the Spirit and gained a better understanding. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.